Well, this morning we have heard of the perfect sacrifice. Now we're going to speak of the one who offered it. Hebrews 5, 9 through 12. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obeyed him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Concerning him we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. The importance of Christ as our high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, cannot be overstated. Under the law of Moses, the duty of the priest and the high priest were varied and many. But it seems obvious to me that the most important function of the priest could be performed only by the high priest himself. And that duty was to make atonement for both his sins and the sins of the people. A sin had to be dealt with. It had to be put away. As our high priest, Jesus has made atonement for the sins of the world. He put away sin through the sacrifice or the offering of himself. This is of the utmost importance for the child of God to understand. And I want to suggest that if a saint of God does not understand this fact, that he cannot function effectively in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Having become perfect, the Bible says, Jesus became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, having been designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The author of the Hebrew letter here understood that his recipients would have a hard time understanding this important truth. Now hear me, not because it was inherently difficult to understand, but because they had become dull of hearing. Amen. Now this subject remains mysterious even today as it is discussed among the brethren. I often hear the complaint, this is deep stuff coming from those who are struggling to understand it. And quite frankly, have you ever tried recently to have a conversation with very many people about Jesus as the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek? I've tried to have this discussion with many people, even several Bible college professors, and I get blank stares. Uh, like, like this is something that, that, why are we talking about this? There are so many other things we should be talking about. And isn't it interesting that the inspired word of God puts this in the category of elementary principles of faith. Yeah. <laughs> the high priesthood of Christ, though it is certainly not milk, it is an elementary and essential teaching yes. of the faith. Mm -hmm. It is part of the foundation of our great faith that was once delivered, and my prayer this morning for the saints is twofold. First, that they will not be dull of hearing. Mm -hmm. Faith comes by hearing, and a dull hearer will have limited and ineffective faith. Mm -hmm. Secondly, my prayer is that they will understand fully the greatness of our Lord Jesus as high priest, mm -hmm. according to the order of Melchizedek. Amen. Now, our worship and relationship with our high priest, is it exists only in Christ and only in the heavenly places. We are told in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6 that uh, he has raised us up and seated us in heavenly places in him, in Christ Jesus. The true, our worship, true worship is in spirit and in truth. The true tabernacle is not on earth but is in heaven itself. Our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly await a Savior. Our blessings are in the heavenly places. Jesus is seated in the heavenly places. The church exists and is recognized in the heavenly places. And our war is in the heavenly places. Amen. Our inheritance is above. Our city, the true and free Jerusalem, is above. Our covenant is heavenly and eternal. And eternal. Our covenant was made between the Father and the Son, as seen in Genesis chapter 15, and confirmed in Galatians chapter 3. It was ratified by the death of the testator, who made effective as the and made effective as the risen testator himself offered his own blood in the heavenly tabernacle. So it makes sense. It really makes sense that the Apostle Paul says that since we have been raised up with Christ, we are to set our minds on things above. Mm -hmm. So as we are doing that and we are gazing through the eyes of faith, it should not surprise us to see that our faithful and merciful high priest is there, uh -huh. ever interceding for us. Amen. He ministers in the heavenly places. He is a heavenly priest and therefore must be of a heavenly order. Now, we understand that an earthly priest 
in a physical tabernacle with physical blood on a physical mercy seat under a covenant that was ratified in the flesh could not do for the world that which was needed to be done. That's right. It couldn't be done. Mm -hmm. The world needed atonement. Amen. And the need for atonement could not be met by a Levitical high priest. As I said earlier, that was the most important job of the high priest, and he could not do it properly. He could not do it effectively. It never worked. Hebrews 7, 11. Now, perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law. What further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? And again in 719, for the law made nothing perfect, and on the other hand there is a bringing of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Now, more specifically, the law, weak as it was through the flesh, could have no spiritual effects. It was for outward conformity, not for inward cleansing. As the Hebrew writer would say in uh, chapter 9, verses uh, 8 through 10, the Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the server perfect in conscience. Since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. The Levitical priesthood could not deal with the conscience. If anything, it made the conscience even more aware of its evil and wicked condition. Amen. Didn't Paul remind us that the law of God, which according to the psalmist, was perfect, the law of God brought the knowledge of sin. Yes, amen. Paul said that he was once alive apart from the law. Then when the commandment came, sin became alive, and he said, I died. That's right. Mm -hmm. He would not have known coveting, he said, had the law not said, thou shalt not covet. Mm -hmm. But sin, taking opportunity through the law, produced coveting of every kind in him, and he said, it killed me. So sin, through the commandment, was not dealt with but sin, as Paul said there in, a, in Romans 7, became utterly sinful. Yes. So we should not be surprised that the work of the high priest according to the law, according to Aaron, would also have a negative effect on the conscience. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have a consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins year by year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. You see, not only were their sins not removed by the offering of the Levitical high priest, but these offerings made um, the people's conscience keenly aware of their sinfulness. Mm -hmm. right. It brought fear and continued to remind people of the great barrier that existed uh -huh. between right. them and God. Amen. No one was cleansed by the blood of animals, and there was not perfection of the conscience. This happened year after year after year. Boy, did these people need help. Did they need hope. Amen. Amen. It would take another type of priest to do what needed to be done. And indeed, such a high priest was raised up. And I know I'm getting, getting uh, ahead of myself, but I have to say we have such a high priest. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 9.14 How much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve mm -hmm. the living God. You see, this high priest could cleanse the conscience from dead works so that his people could effectively serve the living mm -hmm. God. You know, and the prophet Ezekiel prophesied this. He says, I'm going to create a people who can do my will, who can keep my word, who can do the ordinances that I have put forth. Amen. He did this in such a way that the conscience would be free from sin and guilt so that it could boldly approach God without fear of condemnation. 
so that he could not have to worry about his righteousness being as filthy rags, but he could realize that he was clothed with the righteousness of Christ and also that his righteous deed was the fine linen of the bride of Christ. And if the priest, after the order of Aaron, could have accomplished this, there would have been no need for another priest to arise. Amen. A different priest Amen. after the order of Melchizedek. A different type of priest was needed, one of a different order. And, and we have such a priest. Amen. Amen. We have such a priest. I don't know if I can even understand the scope, dare I say the difficulty, the details that would, needed, that would be needed to make this happen. That's why it would take the God of heaven to accomplish this. Mm -hmm. Such a priest would have to be raised up by God. Mm -hmm. Such a priest would have to be eternal. It could not be with the weak power of man, nor could it be temporary. Mm -hmm. And that's why we read in Hebrews 7, verses 15 and 16, And this is clear still, if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not on the basis of the law of a physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. Not based on the physical requirement of the law. As a matter of fact, if he were on earth, he could not be a priest at all, the Bible tells us. For he came from a tribe about which Moses mentioned nothing about priests. And I want to tell you this, not based even on his own flesh. Now, he indeed had to come in the flesh as Durante pointed out so well last evening. But I think as Durante also said, him coming in the flesh was often more for us than it was for him as it related to his high priesthood. But you know, the Bible says even his flesh was weak. He was crucified, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, because of weakness. Amen. And we don't focus on the flesh of Christ. You're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16, that we no longer regard Christ according to the flesh. Amen. He is a priest by the power of an indestructible life. Mm -hmm. He is the risen King of kings, the risen Lord of lords, who cannot be killed. And we have such a high priest. Amen. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing is, Jesus did not even do this himself. The Bible tells us that Jesus did not glorify himself to this position. He didn't do it. Who did? Well, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another passage, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. God did this mighty thing. Now, I just want to point out that the Hebrew writer could have said he didn't glorify himself. God did. He could have just said it that way. But God apparently wanted to make a point here. The writer made it abundantly, abundantly clear that the same one who declared, You are my son, today I have begotten thee, is the same one who said, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And this has great significance. Mm -hmm. When the Lord declared, as recorded in the second psalm, you are my son, the day I have begotten thee, mm -hmm. this phrase was associated with many important and significant faults, such as, there in the second psalm, I have installed my king upon Zion, yeah. my Amen. holy mountain. Amen. I will surely give the nations as thine inheritance. Amen. The very ends of the earth will be thy possession. Amen. You see, as we're talking about, this is my son, today I have begotten thee. This is in reference to the Messiah as the king of glory seated in the throne of heaven. Amen. The glory that he left to come to this earth. The glory to which he longed to return. He prayed for in John 17. And the glory that indeed was restored to him as he ascended back to his rightful, eternal place as he was raised from the dead and seated Amen. in glory. Amen. You see, this, of course, is verified in Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 30, when, uh, when the, uh, it is said, God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers that God has fulfilled this promise to our children in that he raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, You are my son. 
today I have begotten thee. You see, the same God who reseated Jesus on the eternal throne is the one who restored his glory as eternal high priest. Not according to the weakness of the flesh, but by the power of an indestructible life. The priesthood shall never end. The high priest will never die. Amen. He ever intercedes for the saints. He is a priest forever. The Hebrew writer emphasizes this again and again, and we have such a high priest. Amen. Amen. It had to be this way. Mm -hmm. God intended it from the beginning, and he assured us that it would happen. We've already referred to Psalm 110, particularly in verse 4. He said with an oath, and I will not repent, or will not, the Lord will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. It's interesting that the God, God had made a promise that he will not change his mind on this. Yes. Now, God many times said, I have made a decree, I've made a decision, but if you'll do this, I'll change my mind. If you do this, I will stop. As a matter of fact, even when Job was preaching to Nineveh, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed, you know, he didn't even say repent. We didn't have it on record. He was just going through saying, it's over, folks. <laughs> but the Ninevites took this pretty seriously, and they thought, well, maybe if we repent, even though that's not the message, maybe if we change, it'll make a difference. Uh -huh. You're told when God saw their deeds, he relented of the evil that he was going to bring upon them. God changed his mind. If you repent, he told the Israelites over and over again, I will not bring this upon you. So we know the Lord working in his great love and to fulfill his will through mankind does make his promises contingent oftentimes on the response of the people, but not with this. Mm -hmm. I've made an oath and I will not change this. There's nothing that anyone in heaven or on earth can do to change this thing. You are a priest forever, Amen. according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, before I speak of Melchizedek, I want to make it very clear, and I want us to understand that our interest is not in Melchizedek, but in Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want to know him. And the Apostle Paul said, you know, I press for this goal because that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. It is not about Melchizedek. It's about Jesus. Amen. Amen. The existence of the man Melchizedek was for the sake Amen. of Christ. Amen. Amen. And for our sake as we are seeking to know Christ. Amen. 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 That was his purpose. Amen. The Hebrew writer makes this clear in chapter 7 verses 1 through 3. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, was first of all, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but was made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. I want you to note something here. That the Son of God was not made like Melchizedek, but Melchizedek was made like the Son of God. Amen. Amen. Jesus is the Son of God from all eternity. Amen. And as Melchizedek was being formed by God, God was using this eternal Son as a part of the design for the sole purpose of teaching us, the saints of God, about the priesthood of our Lord. Amen. That was his purpose. Amen. Fleshly minded people were about to have a glimpse of the spiritual. That brings chills to me. People who were born of flesh, who are not born of spirit, were, yet, were about to see a picture of a, the spiritual realm in Melchizedek. And that is how the Lord works oftentimes. Isn't that one of the many reasons that Jesus came to this earth? The Apostle John said in John 20, many other things did Jesus do that have not been written in this book. But these things have been written so that you can believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And by believing, you can have life in his name. And he was speaking to people who were not in Christ yet. Jesus came in the flesh so people could have a glimpse of the Spirit. Now, Kazadek was in the flesh so that people could have a glimpse of that which is in the Spirit. Let us read the short Old Testament reference to this mysterious man. 
Genesis chapter 14, starting in verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, Abraham, Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tenth of all. Now this Melchizedek was made like the Son of God. This man who did these things was formed by God to be like Jesus. These are a few things, a few ways in which he was like Jesus. He was a priest, and he was a king. Aaron could only be a priest. He could not be a king. As a matter of fact, there was often a conflict within the kingdom of God between the priest and the king and their authority. You know, did not Zechariah prophesy that there was going to be one to come that would bring a peace be between the two offices and that the priest would sit on the throne. Mm -hmm. The priest would sit mm -hmm. on the throne. It is interesting that Melchizedek served God, but he also served Abraham. Jesus was an obedient servant Amen. to God, and he also is a servant to the heirs of Abraham. Isn't it interesting that Melchizedek blessed the righteous, whereas Aaron is working with the sinful? Yeah. He blessed the righteous. He blessed God and Abraham. He was the king of righteousness and peace, just as Jesus is our righteousness and he is our peace. Mm -hmm. Now, was he Jesus? I'm not going to get into that. I've been on the emotional roller coaster of, of the ride of all these descriptions. He had no beginning of days of end of years. He exists perpetually. But, but you know... I think the point of God hiding all of this information about his beginning and his end, about giving us so little information about him, was to make the point that it's not about him. That's right. Amen. Amen. We don't know about him because this was never about him. Amen. He was giving us a picture of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, I think it's very interesting to note that Melchizedek never required anything of Abraham, but Abraham freely gave to him. Hebrews 7, Now observe how great this man to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choice spoils. And those indeed are the sons of Levi who received the priest offerings have a commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brother. And although these are descended from Abraham, but the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In this case, mortal men receive tithes, but in the case of... But in that case, one receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes. For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. I want you to understand this. You know, the Levites were commanded to go and collect a tithe from the people. Melchizedek never sought the tithe. Melchizedek was given the tithe freely. Melchizedek was noted for his blessing and not for his taking. Amen. He was noted for this. Amen. Amen. He was made like the Son of God. The Melchizedekian order was patterned after Christ in glory. Just like the tabernacle Amen. on earth was a shadow of the true tabernacle Amen. in heaven. The earth, earthly priest king was a shadow, Melchizedek, the earthly priest king was a shadow of the true priest king in heaven. Thus, when God returned Jesus back to the throne, now hear me, when God returned Jesus back to his throne, he glorified him back to his original position as king and priest after that same original order that was already patterned after himself, the Son of God, that order of Melchizedek, which was his order. His order. Our king and priest ever exist, having made atonement once for all, yet... He continues to bless. He continues to give. Mm -hmm. He is able to save those who come to him even today. He intercedes for us who have come to him even now. 
As a matter of fact, he is the perfect inter intercessor. I don't want to get into Galatians chapter 3 and verse 20 much for it. It says, you know, intercessors between, uh, between two people, but God is one. It is so, that is the perfect intercessor. The one who is one with God is interceding with us for God. He's one. Amen. He's the perfect intercessor. Amen. Amen. He gives us every spiritual blessing. And could we not spend all day talking about every spiritual blessing? He continues to give. We can come before him with a clean and clear conscience, and that's what it was about. We can come before him. He was glorified to be priest by the power of an indestructible life. And that same verse that I mentioned over in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, where it said he was killed, he, he was crucified because of weakness, well, the very next statement says, but he lives because of the power of God. He lives because of the power of God. That is why everything is, that is in Christ is better. You know, I think Durante mentioned that as we look at the book of Hebrews, it's talking about everything is better. Everything is better. We, we live and we exist in a new realm. We have a new temple, a new future, a new city, a new covenant. It's all spiritual and it's all in Christ because everything has to be done by a spiritual king and a spiritual priest and the physical would not do. Would not do. These things are all possible because of our high priest who is eternal and is Amen. eternally blessing those who are in him. We have such a one. Amen. We are there with him, it says. That's right. With boldness and relationship, not faced with the awareness of sin. You know, the child who comes to the father trying to please him with fear of judgment because he can never do anything right. That's not how it is with our Lord. That's right. We can come before him with not the awareness of our sin because it's been done away with. We can come to him with boldness, seeking the strength, seeking the faith, should I say, to understand the strength that he's already had us. We've been given every spiritual blessing. We have strength. We just need to develop our faith and understand that. You know, we can come before him to seek help in times of temptation. We can come before him to seek help to do his will. What? Would God ever create a people to fulfill his will who could not accomplish it? You see, we can come before him to seek that help and to have that union. You know, without the awareness of our sins, we don't come before God cowering in fear, thinking about not only what have we done now and what, how is he looking at it, but, but how I'm going to mess up tomorrow and everything he asked. We come before him with boldness. There's no consciousness of sin. Amen. There was atonement. Sin is done away with. Now, the Bible says we have been purged from the dead works. Now we can serve the living God. It helps us to understand what, uh, what it, it says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works. You know, and this is not just a silly little statement that makes us feel like we have purpose. The only way we could do the works of Christ would be to, to be created in Christ Jesus. So we could work with him with a clear conscience. God helps us to know this. We need to pray that we can see this. Mm -hmm. Isn't that why the Apostle Paul prayed in mm -hmm. Ephesians 1.18 yeah. that the eyes of our hearts be enlightened so that we can know all those things, but particularly that we can know the great power that's within us, the same power that raised him from the dead. We need to pray that God helps us to walk by faith and not by sight so that we can know these things, so that we can see our Savior, so that we can see our realm, so that we can see our priests. And we have such a priest. Amen. 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 Very good. Appreciate that. Amen. Comments? I appreciated those points that you made about um, about old Melchizedek. The, the point of this whole thing is really not about Melchizedek, but about yeah. Jesus. Uh -huh. And how you brought out that you know very very little about Melchizedek but and because that's that's not really the point. The point is about Christ. That's right. You know, and he's a shadow of what Jesus would do. You know, I meant well, to say in that as well, but I was getting too excited that uh, <laughs> that really is the point of us too. To not know much about us but know about Jesus. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It was very good, especially as uh, bringing out this insight that he was made like the Son of Man or the Son of God. Mm -hmm. He was made. 
Mm-hmm. Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. The revelation we have of Melchizedek was to show us something about Christ. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was very good. Amen. 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 I like how uh, brought out that he's a, an eternal blessing priest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what he's known for is mm-hmm. blessing. Mm-hmm. And uh, the mediator, it's not a mediator of one, but God is one. Mm-hmm. I think you said you didn't want to go there, but you, <laughs> it's good that you did. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to go there because I spent hours thinking about it, so I thought we would have time for that. Glorious truth. And that's the mediator that we have. Mm-hmm. One with the Father. Mm-hmm. Amen. He said the Levitical priesthood could not deal with the conscience, but made the conscience more sensitive to uh, to sin and shortcoming. That was a that was a good uh, mm-hmm. observation there. The, the the sacrifices continued to reveal to them the mm-hmm. Levitical priesthood the great barrier that existed between them and God. Mm-hmm. Right. And then this priest had to be raised up by God. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, this matter of the, mentioned the flesh of Christ, but I want to talk about that in contrast with the humanity of Christ. Now, I know that the, humani- that the word humanity is not the, uh, that's not a Bible word, is it? So we'll talk about him as the son of man. We'll use that word, okay? That's what I mean by the humanity of Christ. Now, as the flesh of Christ, we're, we're really not concerned about, you know, the day, you know, the days of his flesh as far as the dealings, you know, his brothers and sisters and his life at, in Nazareth, you know, and his, you know, and those sort of things. But we, but we are very much interested in this aspect of his identification with us. Mm-hmm. This is where the great high, his high priesthood, see, this is, this is where it derives its effectuality. Mm-hmm. And, and this, in this realization, this dawning upon your spirit, that this Emmanuel, this is Emmanuel, God with us, mm-hmm. and this is, you know, God manifest in the flesh, and so in the, in that perspective, see now here from that perspective, uh, we, we are very much interested in this aspect, we have to be, mm-hmm. in order to be, uh, you know, in order for us to, so otherwise there's really no, no resonance between us and God, see there just isn't, so but but with, with God with us, when Jesus, you know, when in this matter of Emmanuel, you know, God actually, God actually became near to us. He actually brought God near to us, and and we've been brought near to God. So these both both ways, uh, mm-hmm. this is you know by the putting away of our sin, you know. But the but but anyhow, both of these aspects. But but then again, but this is good for us to think about, as Brother Phil said. The you know, this, this matter, we, you know, in, in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, uh, we know no man after the flesh, even though we knew Christ after the flesh, right? But but we're not really interested in that aspect of Christ, right? Mm-hmm. We're not, that's not the thing we focus on, is the, is, is the life, you know, that life that he had, you know, right. as a carpenter, and, and you know, that's not, that really won't do you any good. You know, that really, that really won't n- nourish your faith. You, but this matter, you've got to know about this matter of his identification with us. Right. Mm-hmm. Any other thoughts? With the, with the Levitical priesthood, they had the priests there at all times. They could go in the temple and see the priest and the high priest. With Melchizedek, what they had was the record which God had given of them, of him, in his word. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate how it was brought out that Christ's priesthood is a spiritual priesthood. And because there is spiritual work that had to be done. And um, in the same way that, that we have to look back to see Melchizedek, his priest was not there on earth. In the same way we, by faith, take hold of, of this understanding of Christ's priesthood, too. Yeah. Based upon the record. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
me, Brother Phil made this observation that we don't know much about Melchizedek because this was never about Melchizedek. That's that's a good way to put it. And really, we don't need to know any more than what that's that right. little bit of editing that the Holy Spirit did about him. There's just we just he came on the scene and then he went off the scene, mm-hmm. right? And then and that's and that's all we need to know. Yeah. And if it wasn't for Christ as our High Priest, we would know we would never even heard of Melchizedek. Yeah, he never would have been brought up. 